Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in tonight for the Future of Denver series powered by DU. My name is Gertie Harris, and I'm the founder of Fireside at Five. We are a community-based programming and activation collective that works with local organizations and companies to educate, inspire, and mobilize through in-person and virtual events. Tonight, we have our fifth Fireside Chat of the series, which will explore how we can increase community involvement and empower diverse stakeholders within Denver. This Fireside Chat is one of a six-part live stream series that Fireside at Five is putting together with DU. Our Fireside Chats are meant to be collaborative, solution-driven, and engaging. So we would love for anyone watching at home to get involved in the discussion by commenting and asking questions through the chat feature on Facebook or YouTube. Lastly, we'd like to give a special thanks to all of our panelists who are joining us today and the University of Denver for diving into these topics with us and furthering these important conversations. I'd like to thank Do303, our media partner who is helping us amplify this message and Mythology Distillery, our third beverage partner of the Future of Denver series, who's been so supportive and is offering 10% off cocktail kits. Just be sure to use the promo Denver Future when ordering online. Thank you all again for tuning in tonight. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our facilitator for the evening, Brian Elizardi, the Director of Alumni Engagement for the University of Denver. Thank you, Gertie, and welcome everyone. My name is Brian Elizardi, and we continue our Future of Denver series and our partnership with the alumni team at Fireset at Five to uncover the key drivers uh, that will define the future of our beloved city here in Denver. And I'm very pleased to be joining you from the University of Denver, where we have a proud tradition of producing graduates who are committed to shaping the public good in Denver and around the world. Our goal with this series and our goal really overall is to, to power the people and the projects that are helping to make Denver a more inclusive, authentic, and vibrant city. You know, this month we, we begin the final installment in, in our six part series on the future of Denver. And tonight's chat, we're talking about a very important topic, uh, which is the future of civic engagement and community involvement. And how do we inspire a new sense of ownership across the city? You know, uh, we have so many new Denverites that have joined us over the last decade. And so the success of our city really is predicated on uh, equipping people and, and, and ensuring a sense of ownership broadly across all of our communities, both for those who uh, are proud to call Denver uh, their new home, but also to those who have called Denver home for, for generations. And when it comes to this concept for tonight's chat, this idea of a healthy civil society, you know, one of the key metrics of success is participation in our democracy. And we're emerging from a very contentious national election season where a record 87% of Coloradans turned out to vote. Over 3.3 million people voted across the state with nearly half a million of those coming from the city of Denver alone. And one of my favorite stats is that young voters came out in strong numbers again this cycle with 18 to 35 year olds making up about 27% of the total electorate. So um, all those are great numbers and yet despite that we continue to see some concerning trends around the city. There is persistent income inequality that undermines economic mobility and civic trust. The educational achievement gap continues to widen and we're struggling with how to support learners and students and their mental health in these remote learning environments. And we're also seeing environmental degradation across communities, especially along the inverted L that runs through the I-25 and I-70 corridors. And so tonight we're, we're gonna dig deeper, I think on, on some of these tensions and explore some creative solutions for increasing community involvement and engagement across the city. And you know, to do that in Denver, we really have this very proud tradition of rolling up our sleeves and getting immersed to really challenge the status quo. So joining us to explore some insights and some solutions, it's really a, a great diverse panel that we've assembled of local government officials, business owners and academics that I'm super excited to uh, hand the floor over to and, and more importantly to introduce you to. And so with that, we're gonna um, we're gonna go around the group and I'm gonna have them introduce themselves and uh, just share a brief little bit about their background and also just sort of address a central prompt and that, you know, what does this concept of, you know, civic engagement and 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 what does it mean in Denver, especially in the backdrop of 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 where we are right now, looking at COVID-19, looking at the pandemic. So to, 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 to get us uh, started off, I'm, 
I'm going to start with Tariana Navas Nieves from uh, Denver Arts and Venues. So Tariana, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for, for having me. Um, no pressure starting with me. Uh, so what I think about civic engagement for me, I think about belonging um, is how, when we think about civic engagement, it's making a difference in one's community, but it's about thinking about the moral civic justice dimensions of the issues and seeing yourself as part of those challenges or those or that hope for your community. So for me is um, not just the feeling that entices you to, to be engaged civically in your community, but um, that personal connection and the development of, again, that sense of belonging that you are a part of it for the positive that you build together, but also to feel the pain that others are feeling, uh, even if it's not directly impacting you, is the ability, right, to uh, bring that empathy piece uh, and join others uh, through the good and the bad. I love that. Thank you so much, Tariana. Next up is uh, Janie Carpenter, adjunct faculty from our Corbell School for International Studies and also DU's University College. Janie, thank you so much for being here tonight. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Janie, so we can hear all these great words. Sorry, making sure the dogs aren't barking in the background. Um, but one of the things that I guess for me, it similar to what Tariana said, it's a sense of belonging, but it's also a con contribution of, you know, how do you give back? How do you help make places better? Um, and recognize that things are, that a lot of issues, I love Denver, I've lived here a very long time, and I've lived in a lot of other major cities, and often the social and economic challenges are very complicated. You have multiple stakeholders and different voices, and you have to make sure you're listening to all voices and that you really listen and understand before jumping to solutions. And I think that civic engagement is sometimes pausing to actually listen and learn instead of jumping to an opinion. Love that. Thank you so much, Jenny, for being here tonight. Kevin Calabari, co-founder of uh, Sexy Pizza and Cresco Labs. Thank you so much for joining the program and tell us more about kind of what tonight's topic means to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I, I, I've tackled civic engagement on a lot of levels as a private business owner, as a resident, um, activist, advocate um, from a, a, a lot of different places on a lot of different topics. And you know, I, I think what, what's some, what I would like to have us focus more on is, and voting is important, undoubtedly. Um, you know, showing up and marching is important undoubtedly, but I think people need to understand better how they can be in, engaged on a daily basis. And it, it's not, you know, doing your duty to vote and you're done for the year. Uh, there's 364 other days that really need folks' attention um, to become educated about what the issues are in the city and, and how they can best participate based on their skill sets, based on uh, where they're at in the city and where they're at in life. Um, you know, city council meetings come uh, to mind, uh, you know, Candy's done a great job to, I think, increase participation and make sure that folks are there. But when they happen at 5 p.m. on a Monday, it's really difficult for folks to get there. So um, finding ways to engage in that weekly conversation that happens where a lot of decisions are made that people aren't um, really aware of. Um, they're not aware of the background behind these conversations and how these things that affect their lives very much, um, how these decisions are getting made. City Council, state legislature. Um, and then just being engaged in your neighborhood, you know, uh, as Denver has grown, neighborhoods of, I should say, communities have eroded within those neighborhoods to an extent. Uh, most people don't know their neighbors. And I think that's a, a big hurdle that we have to get over uh, in a city that, grow, uh, that grew as quickly as Denver did. Um, but I, even, I think most importantly, from my perspective, it's less about um, how we're engaged with um, our government. And it's, it's about behaving better um, in society, especially if you're a business owner. And if, if businesses behaved better in this country, if they took care of employees better, they cared more about the communities in which they operate, um, about our environment, um, the world would be a different place without laws needing to change, without um, our political representatives uh, changing. So uh, I really try to impress that upon people that we really have the tools um, to, to make the change that we wanna see, especially if you're a private business owner. 
Love that. Thank you, Kayvon. Delighted to have you here tonight. Next up is Kate Barton, Senior VP with the Downtown Denver Partnership. Kate, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Brian. Glad to be here. Um, and kind of to what Kayvon was just saying to build on that, I do think that there is a really important ability to use your voice, especially in this moment, especially with COVID. We can all be from be online and you know tune in from wherever we are, which I do think is a huge opportunity as you think about using your voice and showing up and paying attention, not only on the election days or election years even, but all the time in between, because there are a lot of really important conversations, important decisions that happen. And, you know, I, I often, folks will be mad that something had happened, but have no interest in having their voice in the conversation and all the time in between. And I do think that, um, Janie, to your point, if you can listen and you can really be thoughtful about having a conversation and also having conversations that aren't easy, listen to people that don't necessarily agree with you or not necessarily see eye to eye with you and make sure that you're surrounding yourself with both sides of that conversation. I think it helps us all be better listeners and engaged citizens and just better people all around. Thanks so much, Kate. And then last up is Councilwoman Candy Sidabaka joining us from uh, District 9. Candy, thank you so much for, for being here tonight. Thank you. It's hard going last. I kept checking off like what I was going to say. But for me, um, in addition to what everything what everyone else has said, I really think that it boils down to four things um, for me. And it's about ownership, um, reclamation, stewardship, and shared responsibility. Um, I think that when you have people who understand and recognize that the city and what's happening around them uh, belongs to them and they have the power to collectively uh, shape the way things are um, happening, then that to me is real community engagement. That's what civic engagement looks like. And what Kayvon mentioned, you know, people integrating this and understanding civic engagement as a daily practice um, and showing up daily to make sure that you know your neighbors, you know what they need and you know how to help them and you know how to help yourself. Um, that to me is what it looks like when it's really successful. I love that. Thank you all so much for being here. And I and, uh, just want to remind everyone that's joining us in the chat tonight, we are talking about civic engagement. and. And uh, if you've got questions for us, we uh, want to encourage you to go ahead and put those into our chat box, no matter what platform you're on. And we'll do our best throughout the, tonight's conversations to kind of sprinkle some of those in. And, and to, to, to get us jump started, uh, Councilwoman Sidabaka, I want to I want to stay with you. You know, when I when I think about this topic about the future of Denver, you know, uh, your story in particular really stands out to me. You know, you're a fifth generation Denver resident. You got started in neighborhood organizing at a very small local micro level fighting the I-70 expansion and protecting the neighbors in Globeville and Elyria Swansea. You also founded one of Denver's most authentic leadership and advocacy training hubs. And what I love most about Project Voice is that it's powered by our youth. And um, then you took the city by storm this last year with your campaign in, in District 9. And you know, so much of your body of work really is um, has been focused on this idea of helping people from marginalized communities locate and activate their voices to increase representation in the decision-making process. And so, um, and getting us started off on, on kind of tonight's conversation and, and this topic, my, my question for you is, is how do we go about making sure that participation is more accessible? And how do we also meet citizens where they are so that they can begin to have a real impact on the issues that we're gonna face over this next year and, and beyond here in Denver? Um. I, it's interesting because it wasn't something that I ever uh, imagined would snowball into where I'm at today. Um, I'm a big sister um, and I was always taught, you know, take care of your sister and brother, um, protect them. That sense of guardianship was instilled in me at, at a very young age. And my activism started before I recognized it, rec recognized it as activism. I live in a super fun site. Um, I went to the, the first school in DPS that was experimented on for um, ed reform. And 
my first real fight was fighting for an honors class at my high school because they got taken away when our school was transformed from a traditional high school into um, three separate schools within a school. And I didn't recognize it as activism. I recognized it as doing what was needed in a situation where nobody else was speaking up for us. And so that's really, I think, um, what I think we need to tap into when we're trying to get people engaged civically. We need to understand um, you know, what affects people on a daily basis. How do people understand um, and describe their own experience in Denver, in their communities, in their workplaces? What are the things that bother them? What are the things that make them take pride and joy in the communities that they're a part of and build off of those things. Working with young people, um, we talk about civic engagement at, at three different levels, the self, the community, and the systems. And for young people, what we try to do is um, really use the methods of communication and information absorption that they are accustomed to. I'm the youngest person on city council and love to use social media to talk to my constituents. I get in trouble doing that um, from my colleagues. And it's interesting because we are part of these systems or government is this system that actually re relies on us not paying attention. And so to, to take the information and be interpreters um, with a range of different methods is how we'll be successful at um, attracting new audiences to the space. I'm glad Tariana's on this call because Tariana knows best that my, my campaign, um, my work has been successful because of other people. I don't rely on my own nerdiness to to carry me and teach people about policy. I rely on the creativity of artists around me who like lots of different forms of communication, artistic communication, and they take the nerdiness of policy and government and they turn it into something that is accessible to anybody at any level. And that is what we need to do to transform politics and transform cities really. I love it. Thank you so much, Candy. And and Kate Barton, I want to I want to come to you next because, you know, the the flip sides of, of that coin often is what role does business and you know and organizations like the Downtown Denver Downtown Denver Partnership play, you know, when it comes to increasing access and and the voices of, you know, of, of various entrepreneurs across the city. So, you know, you you manage the partnerships work to foster this culture of entrepreneurship across the city and and two of the programs that DDP co-funds are the Denver Startup Week, uh, largest free entrepreneurial event in the world, as Eric Matisic will continue to remind me, um, and also the Commons on Champa. So both those are geared towards uh, supporting entrepreneurs in a variety of ways through mentorship and through funding and, and network expansion. And so talk to us about the impact that these programs have had you know, uh, on the city and why it's so important to make resources in particular accessible to those who help to create this more inclusive and vibrant local community in Denver. Thanks, Brian. So um, yes, Eric is one of our co-founders of Startup Week and won't let you forget that Denver has the largest free entrepreneurial event in the world, um, which I feel sounds a little Dr. Evilish, but he loves it. Um, but I do think that these platforms, the Commons being one and Startup Week being the other, are really important programs, not only because they're free, um, our goal is to have low or no barrier to access, but also because they're able to create a platform where people can come and tell their story, gain information from other people, find people who are going through similar sorts of challenges. I think this year we took Startup Week virtual for the first time. We had 15,000 people join us from around the world. Um, 35 different countries were represented and we were able to tell this incredible story about Denver and about the things that are happening here and about the challenges that we've faced, but also the innovations that people are taking and the pivots they're doing on a daily basis. And I was really proud to watch the community tell stories about mental health and how to take care of yourself and your team and how to be vulnerable and to lead with a lead with vulnerability in a time when everyone is experiencing something. And I think that really flips the script on this conversation around entrepreneurship and how every single person who's an entrepreneur has to go and get VC funding. And that's 
such a not the correct at all. Um, you know, that's a really Pollyanna view of what it means to be an entrepreneur and also completely disregards all of these different diverse voices and leaders who are shaping our communities and really will drive innovation for our city for the future. And so when you think about Startup Week, which is this national platform, um, and then the commons where every day we're providing mentorship and um, access to capital, access to resources. Um, we have a nine week business boot camp program that serves 70, I think about 76% underrepresented, traditionally underrepresented entrepreneurs. Those are really important programs because they're bringing people together, helping people to think about the role that they play in this community, but also meet other people and be able to drive, you know, not only their own innovation forward, but often those collisions lead to some really incredible ideas that I think will be better for our community and our city and those individuals in the long run. So it's a really great platform. And I think not only tells the story of what we have to offer, but lets people be able to use their voice in a way that is um, different and and really empowering. Thank you, Kate. I want to segue to, to one of our uh, more notable entrepreneurs here. Um, and so uh, Kayvon, you're you're kind of a self-described entrepreneurial rebel rouser and, and you co-founded over seven companies. And uh, one of which is I mentioned my family's favorite sexy pizza. And um, it's considered Denver's most civically engaged and community driven restaurant. So. Talk to us more about a specific model um, that you've implemented within your organization, this employee ownership model, and how we can begin to look at how we nurture a sense of citizenship and ownership over the future of our city. Yeah, thanks. It, it took us a while to get here. You know, I'm one of four partners in Sexy Pizza. We uh, formed about 13 years ago, and now we have our four locations. And it really took that scale for us to be able to provide the benefits and to take care of our employees the way that we had hoped. Um, but there was a, I, I'd say a, a strong uh, lesson that I learned along the way of, you know, I, I started essentially homeless, uh, Sexy Pizza. And, you know, I, I grew up in a family that was put in bankruptcy twice before I was 10. Um, parents got divorced when I was 10, been living on my own since I was 16 had that bout with homelessness. So in my mind, you know, growing up um, pretty poor and, and having money be such an issue and having a strong family, um, it, it was about money to me. You know, being a business owner was about making money. And when you look around and whether you're watching a movie or reading a book or looking at best practices, you know, they preach um, increasing bottom line as like the driver in owning a business. And, you know, similar to how I guess, you know, men have, you know, been planted all these seeds about how we, you know, behave inappropriately with women. I think business owners do the same. They're, they're shared all these examples that are extractive, that are in, at the end of the day, not best practices because they are not what's best for employees in those communities uh, for the environment. And I think we're starting to see that change, but it took me a long time to get there. It took, um, you know, being in the cannabis industry and, and taking a company public and seeing the extractive nature of that process and how much really fake money is made off the backs of uh, people that are not making a whole lot. Um, and it took Denver growing into what it has and to see the folks that, you know, I, I felt that we were paying pretty well when we started. Um, but Denver was a different beast back then. You could still rent an apartment for 800 bucks. Um, and that changed and the competition for good workers changed as Denver grew and more restaurants opened. So we looked inside to see how we could be competitive um, in keeping these folks and making sure that uh, they did stay with us because they, they could have a quality of life in Denver that I think we all aspire to. So, you know, with two shops, we started paying for 50 percent of uh, health insurance, I think, was one of the first things that we did. And we had a retirement plan match. Um, but fast forward to now having four shops and, you know, everybody makes uh, at least 18 to 20 bucks an hour. Um, our drivers during COVID are actually making about $48 an hour um, this year on average. Um, most employees probably walk away with 22 to 25 at a minimum. Um, our GMs walk with close to six figures. Uh, we have profit sharing for all general managers and assistant managers. Uh, we have PTO regardless of how many hours you work. We offer free health, dental, vision. Uh, insurance to our full-time employees. We just started uh, free healthcare um, offerings uh, with a partnership that we have with Kesset Wellness. Um, we have our PTO or our uh, retirement plan match. And we, we wanted to see what we could do further because as I got into kind of 
this alternate um, shared economy advocacy in Denver. I, I sit on the board of the Center for Community Wealth Building. I'm one of the founding members of the Colorado Solidarity Fund. I've, I've been uh, really educated by a lot of these shared economy entrepreneurs in Denver uh, about you know, worker cooperatives, uh, employee ownership models, and all the varying ways that you can accomplish that. And we looked into it, and over the last year, uh, came to the conclusion that it's something we wanted to dip our toe into. So uh, during COVID, and I, I think we got it all done around June or July, um, if you work 20 hours a week uh, for our company on average throughout the year, um, that you engage in a stock ownership plan. And you know that's something that I, I think we've seen the benefit of our business and these benefits even before uh, we offered the employee ownership. Uh, if you take a look at the fast casual um, restaurant industry, you have about 100% turnover every year. Every position turns over about once. Uh, our turnover in 2019, even prior to employee ownership, uh, was 21%, uh, which I think is, is a testament to you know, how we engage with our employees and how we want to take care of them. Um, we also just started offering uh, to pay for half of the, their down payment on a primary residence um, for a home. And, and we're working that into our model as well. And what I think most folks should realize is, you know, one, we're a small margin pizzeria and we're able to do this. So I know that if we can do it, um, that there's a heck of a lot of other businesses in Denver that make a heck of a lot more money than we do uh, that can be take their, taking care of their employees uh, a heck of a lot better. And that's, that's kind of my comment earlier about how businesses need to behave better. And if we can do it, they can too. And maybe they don't know how, and you know, I want with others to be a resource uh, for folks that want to learn how to do that. Um, and I'm, I, I talk to folks every day um, and how they can implement some of these things in their business. But it starts there. You know, I, I don't want to have to rely on going to city council meetings and, and, and give legislative testimony to try to fight for a higher minimum wage or, or fight for you know, paid uh, medical leave. I mean, I'm going to anyways. But I know that from the private side, we can already do that ourselves and we have the tools to get it done. And if businesses behaved in that manner, I, I got to tell you, a lot of the social inequity um, that we're looking at in this country um, would not be uh, what it is. We would not be fighting for the things that we are. We could probably actually go on to fighting for more um, you know, uh, lofty goals than fighting for things that I would consider human rights, like housing, healthy food, health care. Uh, education and the internet. Um, so I, I just want to serve as, as an example for folks in knowing that there is a better way to get it done, that businesses can still be profitable. And at the end of the day, you know, I got to tell you, I, I haven't put a print ad uh, in uh, anything for Sexy Pizza in a decade. You know, our marketing dollars are spent in providing those benefits to employees in supporting local comedy, art, music, movie programming by donating um, food to uh, you know, nonprofits and schools throughout Denver. That's our marketing budget. And I got to tell you, it's it's paid us back, even though it's not a tangible coupon that we're getting back. Uh, it's paid us back more than I could more than I could count um, because people associate us with being uh, that that really responsible business in Denver. And people care about that. And when we make a mistake, they're more apt to forgive us. Um, so it's not just, I think, the right thing to do and, and, and the best thing for employees. Um, at the end of the day, it's been great for our business model and our bottom line. And I know we're in a we have an interesting business model with delivery and takeout, uh, but we've thrived, you know, during COVID. And <clears throat> I, I know that not everybody has the opportunity to deliver and carry out, but I know we're doing a lot of a uh, lot better than others that aren't because of the conversations that are happening in this country and uh, the things that we do. That I think that align with what people want to see in their businesses. that they support. I do have a quick follow-up question for you, Kayvon. Um, my mom always has an expression where it's, you know, if you invest in your employees, they'll invest in you. So how have you seen your employees kind of, you know, react to this employee ownership model? Like how have you seen, you know, their their drive and and their passion increase it's, it's a good question it's 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 tough to you know we we hire a lot of 18 to 25 year olds and it's amazing that we probably have 70 employees that would qualify for free health dental and vision and probably 30 to 35 take us up on it um, some because they're on their parents health insurance plans others just think they're invincible because they're young um, but 
I don't think people go into these kinds of jobs, especially at a pizzeria, and think that these kinds of things are available. You know, they haven't been at other jobs they've been in. Um, so there's a really healthy education component to what we do that has to be a part of it. Um, so, you know, we engage our employees on a weekly basis in all sorts of training and education around this. It's not just about having that stock in the company. It's about hopefully increasing their financial literacy uh, in a way that whatever they do after Sexy Pizza, um, whether they want to be an entrepreneur themselves, whether they're going to go, you know, do what they do at ours, but go be a manager somewhere else, um, to have an increased capacity um, with how to run a business, I think, is something that that we're trying to drive home. But it, it is tough sometimes. It is not easy to get um, young people that are a bit uh, disenfranchised, that don't feel that, you know, that just don't have the experience with these kinds of things being offered to them um, to, to really get them fully bought in. Um, so we know that our work is um, cut out for us um, going forward, but we're fully prepared to take it on. And, and you know, we're, we're paying for that education too. We're, we're hiring folks that have been there, done that on the employee ownership side and coming in and, and really letting our employees understand how this benefits them as well. And we're not just sitting idly by and having these be passive programs. Uh, these are things that we're doing to, you know, set their expectations higher, not just for in our company, for, for when they go to others. And I think that retention is a big uh, part of, um, or a, big, a great example of how we've benefited as a company uh, from that. Keeping people around is uh, very uh, important for a company when it comes to, to saving money. It's, it's, a, it's a part of that P&L that you don't really see uh, caught in that training and customer mistakes and, or uh, mistakes that piss off customers, things like that. There's a lot of ways that new employees um, can do your business a disservice. Um, so just keeping keeping folks around and having it be very second nature to them um, has, has really dramatically helped us grow. And I think we expect to grow dramatically as a company even more going forward because we have this employee buy-in um, and, 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 and giving these people the sense of ownership and this pride in it. Um, I think we're starting to see it develop and, and I'm sure it's gonna increase going forward. I think um, also I just wanna add that it's not just good for business. Um, I think that what we often encounter as activists or people trying to get more involved in or more people involved in civic engagement is that the number one barrier to being involved um, is people's lack of time due to the need to work all the time. Um, and so when we see that the majority of the population is in an exploitative workplace, um, we know that our civic engagement will be limited uh, by sheer time. Time in a day, there are not enough hours. And we forget that this entire government um, was designed to maintain the concentration of power and wealth. And so it's like a chicken or egg conversation. If we don't engage, we allow the system to continue to exploit people and we allow the power and wealth to continue to be concentrated. Um, but if we are, if we have business owners like Kayvon who are allowing people to live um, to a livable wage and to have the time to engage, then you have the opportunity to dismantle and redistribute, redistribute wealth and power so that other people aren't in that exploitative cycle. And, and one very, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Tariana. I was just gonna say that, you know, being civically engaged is a privilege, right? And I think, you know, I spend a long, long time, even, you know, for a, a, a tangible example is, you know, we have the 1% for public art, you know, projects that are over a million dollars, allocate 1%, community people, right? It's, it's a community group that makes those decisions. And it is this, this narrative and expectation that you have this time to take time, you know, in the middle of the day and sit down in a meeting and make decisions, right? That is a privilege. So I spend so much time saying, we need to pay for people's time because we cannot expect that people have my privilege that I can say, I'm gonna go and spend an hour sitting down and making decisions, right? Is if we're asking people that maybe have an hourly job to take time or look you know, for a daycare or take, I mean, their time is valuable. So it, it was even a process for me to say, yes, paying to, for people to engage in, in civic decision-making 
it is critical if we actually want to have, you know, voices that have not been at the table, you know, historically. So, you know, now it is for us, it's like, yes, I will pay people for their time to be civically engaged because it's our win, right? Is we're actually asking them to support the government and the civic process. So I think it's like Kevin said, is is definitely lead by example as a business. And then it also falls on government, right? Is I am in a position that, of privilege that then I have the privilege and the power to make decisions that are actually going to impact those that are gonna benefit us, so. That's what I was actually gonna say was that uh, Candy got me a reminder of the fact that we do pay people, you know, give them time off to go to vote, pay for them to do that. They wanna go give a uh, testimony at the state legislature we've done, legislature we've done before, we'll pay them hourly for it. Uh, we engage in a lot of employee um, activation in our neighborhood. So Harm Reduction Action Center, for example, you know, we pay folks to go out and pick up trash or do their free needle exchange or, you know, a myriad of other things. And I think it's really important for us as a business owner, very little time, very little money involved in in paying your employees to be engaged like that. And and man, they feel great about it too once once they get out there and do it. Professor Jenny Carpenter, I, I want to pull you into this conversation and this dialogue too. You know, this one of the key threads I think is emerging is the importance of ensuring access to resources and often the privilege that's associated with that. And so much of your work has focused on this relationship between economic empowerment and the role that plays in fostering a sense of citizenship and identity and, and even ownership. So um, my question for you is how do we connect these resources to the most disenfranchised in our city? You know, how, um, how do we go about translating that in a way that promotes this greater sense of, of engagement and, and involvement that, that the group is talking about? Well, and to tie that a little bit just to what Kayvon and Candy and uh, Tariana uh, mentioned is I think that at least in my experience, people are more motivated to have civic engagement when they have the time, when they have the, you know, the basic, their basic needs are met. And as you said, it's a luxury, right, to a certain degree. Um, but the ability, what I find really exciting about Denver is that businesses like Sexy Pizza can make that a distinguishing competitive advantage that they have this responsible business, um, socially responsible business approach. We have social enterprises, we have social entrepreneurs in Denver, and um, you know the Downtown Denver Partnership um, has really promoted with through um, Startup Week and all these other resources. You know we sort of have this entrepreneurial mindset that let's try new things, and I think a lot of businesses are rewarded with that from that here in Denver, which we have a market that people are willing to care about that, right? And reward businesses who will pay employees better, offer um, you know encourage volunteerism in their communities, and. Um, also give people a shot, right? A first job, an opportunity to have a mentor, to learn on the job. I think often that create that access to that first job and, and, and getting on the employment track is often really hard. Um, so Brian, back to your point. I mean, um, a lot of the groups that I have worked with over the years consulting and that I use in a lot of my examples in my classes are, um, nonprofits and social enterprises that are trying to fill those market gaps and improve access to resources. Um, when you talk about empowerment, empowerment's kind of a tricky thing, right? You have to have people need to feel confident and motivated to invest their time and their energy and their, re and their savings into a business, for example, right? Or a home. Um, and they also need access to the resources to do it, whether that's credit, capital, education, um, uh, market information, like, you know, uh, bandwidth and internet access is increasingly important to everybody. Um, and um, I think those are all things that we're still struggling with to how to do more equitably and equally. Um, but there are a lot of innovative nonprofits out there that are trying to fill those market gaps. Um, but access, I think, is a huge theme of, um, you know, there are structural barriers if people don't have access to the resources they need to help lift themselves up. But they also have to feel confident and and um, that strong sense of community that it's worth the effort to invest in their community. And and sticking with you, you know, I, I just um, 
I'm thinking about, you know, it's kind of just a follow up to what you're talking about, Jamie, that what role does social enterprise play? I think when we start to think about Denver's recovery, you know, um, we're in a world now where we're increasingly getting used to social isolation, you know? Um, and so when we think about the future of Denver, really, if you look at the next six months, as we get through the sort of this third wave, mm -hmm. you know, what role can social enterprise play really in helping us to, to think about that and to address some of the social causes that are really, we, we know that despite, you know, some of these access issues and some of the efforts that have been paid to, to address them continue to persist. I guess my view on that is that social enterprises, social entrepreneurs are people who can see problems, who who turn up problems into opportunities and say, how can we then address that challenge in a different way, right? And 2020 is challenging us all to find opportunity, be, to keep that optimistic mindset. Um, but I think those social entrepreneurs and social enterprises, Brian, are are looking for find to narrow gaps to find new ways to deliver resources, like nonprofits who um, very successfully had to trans, you know, those that had to, to transition to an online delivery platform and staff coordination, you know, in one week back in March when everything closed down, right? Um, organizations got very innovative in trying to figure out how do we make this work better, um, given the hand we're dealt, right? Um, and some have really come up with innovative, innovative ways to expand their resources, right? Rocky Mountain Microfinance Institute has expanded their small business training programs that serve underserved, um, underserved communities and first-time entrepreneurs. Um, you have lenders, uh, sort of non-traditional lenders, community development lenders like DreamSpring and Colorado Enterprise Fund who are really doing a lot more outreach and more to lending to more startups because people are having to sort of trying to find a way to get back on their feet and build their own enterprises or own, uh, you know, gigs and consult and opportunities to earn income where their formal jobs may have gone away. Um, I think the other thing I think is, is, so access is so important and having a flexible system to adapt and change as the markets change. And we had a huge market shock, right, this year. So how do we use, adapt to new technologies and how do we, do um, use the current resources we have, but be flexible enough and agile enough to find new ways to re reach the popular people who we need to reach and make sure they have access to those opportunities. That's a big challenge. And that's one of the things that we, I like to talk about is that entrepreneurial mindset. I know you and I have talked about that before, but we talk about entrepreneurial mindset or innovative mindset. It's kind of like how you approach problems and how you try to figure out new solutions. It doesn't mean you actually have to formally start a business or a nonprofit or some other venture, but being entrepreneurial and how you approach problems, I think that's kind of that resilience and what we hope that, you know, we all want the next generation to have, right? Because there's plenty of problems to go around, both environmental, social, economic. Um, we're going to need people who want to make Colorado and Denver thrive and all the people every to thrive on for that uh, in a way that benefits all the, the citizens not just a small percentage i wanted to just jump in and, and add a quick comment to that um when we first started fireside back in march um right at the onset of the pandemic one of the things that we wanted as like kind of our core pillar was to be accessible to people and i think virtual lends itself to that format really nicely um, we started off by just hosting industry chats where anybody could join, regardless of their age, their background, their socioeconomic status, their education. And when you get on a chat with a CEO and, and you're sitting there and you're a marketing assistant, and all of a sudden you have that connection to somebody and you have an hour of uninterrupted time, that kind of creates that accessibility that maybe otherwise wouldn't be there. And so I think by getting creative with these kinds of solutions, like you're saying, we can provide access um but but we have to make we have to make it free we need to make it easy to use um you know people have to be willing to donate their time um you know there are a lot of leaders out there that would maybe say no to joining a chat with people that aren't at their same caliber but some might say that's an opportunity to give these people insight that they might not otherwise have access to so i think that's a really good point that you brought up and, and i am curious if any of you guys um have any other comments on that as well I'll just add that I think the combination of entrepreneurial mindset or innovative mindset and the fact that innovation will be the thing that propels us forward in the hardest times 
with the fact that people here just want to help. I think that's something really unique about Denver is people are willing to help and give their time and, you know, be able to have a Zoom chat or a coffee or whatever that looks like, but also help to educate people and make sure that people understand the issues that are going on using their platforms to make sure that the issues are really clear and transparent and whether that is in the realm of, um, you know, politics or in the realm of entrepreneurship, I think that there's a lot of amazing ways to get information right now that um, will help to propel us forward. I, I have really, really strong belief in that. And that if we can help each other and have that mindset, we're, we're ultimately going to have hard times, but we'll have, we'll be able to overcome them and, and kind of make our way through through the madness. I would just like to point out, because I'm that girl who always points this out, um, we have this myth associated um, with capitalism and that capitalism is the only thing that inspires innovation. And I think COVID has really shown us that it's not capitalism. In fact, it's the opposite. And you know, the way that capitalism is extractive um, and, and puts us on a hamster wheel where we don't have time that is what limits innovation. COVID with all of the time on our hands has proven to us that all we need is a little bit of time to do more of all of the good things. Um, whether that is you know, gardening, taking care of ourselves, reading, researching, baking, taking care of our family or inventing new ways of problem solving. We've never seen as much innovation around mutual aid um, before because people didn't have the time to be able to coordinate these networks. And so I like to always keep um, this experience at the forefront of these conversations because we have, it's taken a global pandemic to prove to us that innovation is not inextricably, inextricably linked to capitalism. And we can create an entirely different world if we want to, that might even have more innovation than we've ever seen before because more people will have the opportunity to innovate. Most of our innovations that we're relying on right now, like um, the, the lending pools, the lending circles, the, the lifts, the, the delivery services, the cooperatives, the family and friend neighbor care, like those things were invented and existed in communities that had the least resources before somebody put a name on them and started making money off of them. And I think I love that you bring the idea of why now, because the reality is a lot of these communities that we're talking about that have been either historically uh, under-resourced or you know, have been the most innovative and creative out of necessity. And when I think about, you know, Crisis is not new, you know, for these communities. Um, you know, I think about the disability community, right? I'm a mother of two young people with disabilities. And, you know, their reality is living in a way that it was not anticipated. And they have to navigate the world through creativity, every step, every decision that they make, right? And this is accepting a reality you know, of things that may not change, but that you can still be creative and succeed within that. So I think what's very interesting is that it's taking not a crisis, but a collision, right, of a health pandemic, of an economic crisis, and this reckoning of racial injustice that, again, is not new, is that collision that all of a sudden we are looking at, right, the devastation, but we are not taking the time to hibernate and look at the beauty, right, of what it is to look at crisis in a different way that may be new for those that have had it maybe easy in the past, but it's not new for those that have not, right? It actually has made them respond in a way that is much more familiar, you know, to them. And I just think it's important to, you know, to be willing, right, to, to examine ourselves and say, why am I so surprised? Why am I so, you know, uh, shocked about these responses when maybe the neighbor, maybe that one that is next to me has actually been responding to crisis on a daily basis? So I just wanted to put that out there because I think, again, it's just 
we need to shift the narrative and we need to be willing to own the fact that it's up to us. And we are many times the ones that are just continuing this narrative of shock and surprise in responding to crisis when this has been the norm for so many. I've also seen a, a mindset uh, develop in folks during the pandemic where I don't think folks think of themselves as, you know, if you're an artist, that you're just an artist, or if that you're a business owner, you're just a business owner. Um, I, I did this event, I don't know, four or five years ago now called Art And. Um, Candy was there, um, Tariana and Arts and Venues helped me um, produce it. And it was about, you know, this intersection that hopefully we could get people in the mindset of that if you're an artist, you know, hopefully you can thrive on the art that you create and, and know how to, to make yourself financially um, sustainable in, in what you do. Hopefully you are civically engaged with your art and, and, and you give it a voice um, to make sure that it's speaking to the things that you care about. Um, but if you're a business owner, you should engage the creative community and you should be civically engaged. And a lot more folks at the city, you know, uh, I think folks on this call or on this do a pretty good job of it. But there's a lot of folks at the city shock um, that don't really understand business, that don't understand the creative community, that, you know, are there dictating laws and passing laws without really understanding the impact uh, that it's having on people. So I've always had. Uh, grown up with this kind of jack of all trades mindset where I can be all of these things. And I think the more that more people can do that, the better off that we're going to be because you're not going to be in your lane. I mean, all the lanes should be all of our lanes and we should be in them um, if we're really going to understand each other, the issues um, and how to really be innovative. And I and love that you say that issues. because when I think about arts and culture, you know, for me at least, and I'm an artist myself, uh, it's not about visual arts or music or just limited to that. You know, when we talk about culture, it's a way of community. It's the, it's the language we speak, is how we connect as family, is, is the familial, you know, is the food, is it's all of that that makes us a community. You know, that's what culture is about. And I certainly believe and support arts for arts, arts sake, but in in the in the state of our world, in the state of this nation, as we've experienced, I, you know, we don't have the privilege of just staying with arts for art's sake. It's like Kevin just said, it's like arts and, right? Arts and social change, art and social justice. You know, it I just makes me think about a quote by Cesar Cruz, you know, art should comfort the disturbed and should disturb the comfortable. You know, and it's, that's what needs to be driving us, right? It's gonna heal, but it also needs to be, you know, it, to activate us and to, um, you know, prompt us to to question ourselves. And, 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 you know, arts is the one thing, arts and culture, that can be the thread through all of the things that we've talked about today, right? Entrepreneurship, uh, government, um, business, et cetera. And that's a great segue here as we kind of round the corner and, and kind of wrap up our program here. And 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 I think what stands out for me is this idea of kind of reframing, you know. Um, and and I what I hear a lot of from the group is is um, you know <laughs> reframing the pandemic. I think at the at the biggest level, you know, and using it as an opportunity, a catalyst. I think to shift our mindset. I mean, there's there's so much about this this period that we find ourselves in that that is difficult, and not to um, to minimize you know those difficulties, and yet. There is opportunity, I think, and so much of what I think you all represent for for our city is is the chance to to reframe that mindset, you know, and to move maybe from an either or, you know, uh, mindset to maybe a both and, and to expand those opportunities and and to embrace entrepreneurship and design and you know all these um, you know sort of uh, ideas and concepts that are really on on the hemisphere of our brain that we don't normally use. So. Um, with that, I want to I want to sort of um, take us home and um, and come back to the group now. And, and what I want to do is is have everyone kind of go around. Um, and I want to um, pose two questions for you. The first is, you know, um, when we think about 2021, you know, and as you look towards this next year, what aspects of our community are you most excited about? So, question number one is is what are you most excited about? when you think about 2021 in our Denver community. And then the second is, you know, often we, 
we, we hear um, that one of the biggest gaps for engagement and involvement is just um, um, the lack of, of qualified information about the right opportunity. So I'm going to put you into the plug zone <laughs> and I'm going to have you plug an organization of your choice and you are, um, feel free to, to plug your own organization if you want or, uh, but pretty much, you know, shout out, uh, what's one organization or one opportunity you think uh, folks on the call here should get involved in? So uh, question number one, what excites you? And then number two, um, where should people go to get involved? So uh, Kayvon, I want to start with you. Uh, dang. Um, I guess most excited uh, for 2021, I think somebody posed a question about, um, you know, seeing the biggest turnouts in civic engagement ever and how we continue that. Um, I think that is, um, you know, a challenge and an a huge opportunity. Um, we have seen so many folks that didn't previously get involved, um, get involved running for office, um, educating themselves about our issues and trying to find solutions on them. Um, but I, I think probably our, our, our next generation, the younger folks, um, you know, I, I adopted 10 and 13 year old girls this year and I, I mean, they're like way more in tune with the world and what's going on than I was when I was 10 or 13 and to, to see so many young people, you know, Candy mentioned being the youngest on city council. I mean, all across the country, you saw 24 year olds, you know, winning the state legislator seat or this city council seat. That's exciting. And, and, you know, Kay Anderson for uh, DPS and, you know, Project Voice is, is an organization that I, I'm going to let you speak to another one, Candy. Uh, I'm going to say Project Voice because I think it is uh, that impactful and we need to get young folks uh, educated and engaged. Uh, that's the most recent, I don't think we've been even announced yet, but the most recent beneficiary of Sexy Pizza's philanthropic pie money um, is Project Voice. Um, because it is so important and we're never going to keep people engaged. Um, uh, unless we start young and we can't wait until we have another huge crises before, you know, we're like implored to get out in the streets and to be in city council meetings and, and to get all these people running for office. It just needs to be a part of our daily life and we need to start young for that to happen. So um, that would be my, my excitement and my organization. Kate okay, Barton, you're up next. Uh, what excites you about our community in 2021? And, um, where should people go to, to get more involved and and uh, and, and to, to start? Um, well, plus one to what you said, Kevin, Kevin, I think that there is absolutely some, this moment that we're in is a really important one. And the fact that people are engaged and paying attention and having conversations, how do you continue that in the times when there isn't an unbelievable amount of um, noise and urgency. And the thing that I think to just build on that is how do you make sure that we don't go back to whatever normal is? How do we make sure that we're moving forward in a way that is thoughtful and inclusive? And I love what you guys were saying about how do we make this moment more about how do we get out of this hamster wheel or the that you have to work and you can't, that means you ha have to find work-life balance or whatever that looks like for you. But, um, you know, we have people who are just this is a moment that I think if we can look back on it and be proud of how we've evolved, that is a really exciting thing for our communities and our city and our country and beyond. So I feel excited about that. Um, I will do a shameless plug for Startup Week because we were able to record all of our content this year. And so we have over 200 hours of recorded content where people shared all their gold and it is so amazing and it's all up on our website. And I just encourage you if you have an issue or you need to be pushed out of your comfort zone or you just want a little bit of inspiration, there's a lot there. And I would encourage folks to go and check that out um, because I think it's an incredible resource. And every time for me, I, I learn something new, I push myself a little bit further than I thought I could go. And I think that's a really powerful resource. So thanks for the question. Thank you. We'll put that, uh, that link to all the content in our our show notes and our follow-up and we are taking notes here on everything and again we're a solutions oriented chat program here so we're uh, excited to be able to kind of take all this great information and and share that back out with you so councilwoman can you see the baka uh for you uh 2021 and uh your your plug zone 
Um, I am really excited to see the country um, not in presidential crisis mode. Um, so I'm excited to see what people do with their time um, when there's not a presidential election that um, is so important in front of us. Um, I would, I don't usually plug organizations that I don't know a lot about, but I met with a group um, this week that I think is just fascinating. Allies to Abolitionists um, is a new, a new group of people where there's not a political, uh, a political party associated, no age associated. Um, it's a good entry point for learners, for people who want to be better in the world. It's the 2020, 2021 modern underground railroad. And I'm really excited about that. So I'm going to plug them. Love that. Jenny Carpenter, on to you, your turn. What am I excited about? I think, you know, what everybody already has said, I guess the thing that I'm, what I hope that sticks is that people have, a lot of people have stopped and listened and tried to learn about issues they didn't understand. And I think learning and really um, listening to people and trying to understand um, understand the human element, as Candy said earlier, right? What people's lives are like and what they're going through creates empathy and empathy creates a desire and motivation for action, um, whatever way you each of us can do it. And I think that is, I hope we don't lose that when life starts going faster again, right? That empathy I think is really important. And then I also hope that we ask good, continue asking good questions about why are we doing it this way, right? Instead of just assuming that that's the way it is, right? Um, why do why does capital always, private capital always look just for financial returns, right? When social returns are really important, right? And they help us build the community we wanna have. So I really hope those things stick uh, in 2021. Um, we shall wait and see, but um, I certainly hope that's what happens. Um, and in terms of organizations, God, there's so many organizations doing amazing work. I think about the, the thing I've been so impressed with has been organizations that, that provide food for their communities that were hit very hard by job losses. So, you know, things like Grow House and others who are just, they pivoted and just said, okay, here's what our community needs right now. So we're gonna find a way to, to provide it, right? Um, and we're able to adapt very quickly to a new operating environment, you know, with everybody online and wearing masks and cord communicating differently. Um, and I think, you know, it's a big, um, I think there, there are a lot of great organizations out there that are pioneers in finding out new ways to, how do they tackle the same problem from a different angle, given the challenges? And given the new insights we've had, as Gertie said, about how to use technology. So true. Tariana, you're up. Um, so, well, like Candy, I'm, I'm walking a little lighter now that we have a new uh, president. So that has taken a lot of, of the anxiety um, uh, of me. And I would say that when I look at 2021 is... I'm really hoping that the response that we saw this summer um, in terms of uh, equity conversations that, you know, and the cynicism in me, uh, you know, I, I see myself looking at, um, you know, pot potential performative responses and that it won't stay here where we have it now. You know, I'm really looking forward to seeing how um, you know, organizations and those that have a platform uh, actually take that, you know, to the next level. And for me, this is a call to everyone on this panel and everyone listening that if you have a platform, right, and if you have made a commitment to this work, you know, stop, slow down. And rather than feeling the pressure to respond in certain way is stop and take the time to look inward to examine yourself and look at, you know, what does your board look like? What does your staff look like? If you have, you know, if you're doing, you know, um, again, sessions is who is, who are the voices that are speaking out on those sessions? And uh, and I can tell you right now that, you know, I participate in, I'm, I'm an ongoing learner. So I participate in a lot of this conversations. And the first thing I look like, I look at is, do I see myself? 
And if I don't, I can tell you right now that I am not interested, period. Because in this day and age, it is, I cannot, like, you can, nobody can tell me that you cannot find diverse voices and perspectives to talk about any issue. So for me, it's really looking forward to seeing once this, right, this intensity of, of response has passed, where are people spending their time? And how are people really taking the time to be truthful and authentic in their commitment? And I would say, you know, slow down. Uh, I would much rather you take the time to not respond and think and examine yourself rather than, you know, putting, you know, a, a social media hashtag. That for me, like I had, it's, it's again, it's performative, especially if I know that you're not known for this work, right? Um, so that's my hope. And in terms of plugging, I would say that, uh, you know, I think, you know, Candy is very aware of the role she plays in city council, right? Is the youngest person. And for me, it's like, I'm full of pride to look at, you know, so many women of color in city council, right? Is I am the first person of color in leadership at Arts and Venues. I'm the first, you know, director of cultural affairs that is a woman of color, right? So is, I know I probably can speak for Candy that the work we do is for us and our ancestors. And for me, it's the work I do and I carry on my shoulders, the work for all of those young people at Project Voice, right? That are the leaders that are right after us. So the level of responsibility and burden, right? And inspiration that we carry is for me, is I, my plug is for those organizations that are building this future whether it's Project Voice and also Access Gallery. Access Gallery is the only organization in the city that actually looks at people with disabilities. Um, it's been a haven for my son in the past. And that they're actually looking at not just how to um, engage them creatively, creatively, but actually how looking at their future in business, in careers. So really building the future of our city. So um, I guess that's my plug and, and, and my, my hope. Brian, can I say one quick thing? <clears throat> Only because people mentioned the, the the relief that they felt by Biden getting elected. I hope we don't take that as a win. You know, getting Trump gone was a win, but getting Biden is not. Um, it's Biden style politics that led to someone like Donald Trump. Um, so we need to do a lot better at continuing that pressure and not accepting uh, what just happened in November as any sort of win for the things that we're really passionate about. Totally. Well, you guys, we are a few minutes over, but I just want to thank you all for joining tonight. Um, this was a really incredible conversation. Um, as a small business owner myself and somebody that started Fireside at Five right at the onset of this pandemic to try and fill some gaps, this has given me a ton of information to use moving forward. So thank you guys. Um, we care a ton about improving our communities and obviously you guys all do as well. Uh, it's really our mission to curate these conversations um, and encourage collaboration between stakeholders like all of you. So if you can continue to keep in touch and work on projects together, we hope that you will. Um, and if there's anything we can do to support, please let us know. Um, I want to thank Brian for facilitating just an incredible discussion tonight. Uh, the University of Denver, Do303, and our beverage partner, Mythology Distillery. Um, if you liked what you saw tonight, you're in luck because we have our final fireside chat of this Future of Denver series next Thursday at 5 p.m. That's on December 10th. Um, so make sure you register in advance and we will see you then. Thank you all again. Have a great night.